Ryan Mohanraj. I'm director of the Speculative Literature Foundation, and I'm here today talking with George R. R. Martin for what we hope will be a new series of pieces on the craft of fiction. Now, I'm also a wild cards writer, and George is my editor there, and absolutely rigorous in his editorial requests <laughs> that my character's choices have consequences. He has had me kill my darlings on more than one occasion, and always for the better. Uh, but our plan today is to focus on epic fantasy, as seen in his Game of Thrones series. So, I first read your work in shorter form, with pieces like the chilling novelette Sand Kings. As a writer, I'm finding the transition from writing shorter works to novels and longer series to be challenging at times. So if, maybe if you can start by just talking a little about epic fantasy and how you approach it differently than other types of fiction writing, which I know you've written in a wide range of forms. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Um, well, epic fantasy is, um, in its modern form, is, is very much influenced by Tolkien. Um, mm -hmm. I think you have to read Tolkien and, and look at what he did so so successfully. Um, a lot of the, the writers who follow Tolkien imitated him, basically, but I, I think they took the wrong lessons from, from him. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully I took the right ones, but I didn't want to just duplicate Tolkien. I was also reading a lot of historical fiction, um, which is you know, grittier, harder edge, more realistic. Um, and I wanted to meld the uh, epic fantasy tradition with the tradition of historical fiction. Mm -hmm. And that being said, you know, I, I also, I wrote some, some fantasies when I was first breaking in back in the 70s, a few short stories, but mostly I wrote science fiction in those days. The market for science fiction was a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. um, you can look at my science fictions, though, and say, well, this is not, this is not the hard science fiction of uh, the way somebody like Greg Benford w w would write it. This is, this is really fantasy disguised as science fiction. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uh, fantasy in my science mm -hmm. fiction, and there's a lot of science fiction in my fantasy. Uh, well, I'm always trying to think of how things really would be and the practicalities. Uh, you know, one example of that is uh, my dragons. I've always been insistent that my dragons have only two legs. Two legs and the four legs are wings. Mm -hmm. um, because there's no creature on earth that has right. four legs and wings. The, the, the front legs become the wings. Mm -hmm. And these four-legged four -legged dragons really offended my, my <laughs> science fictional sense, my sense of biology and realism. And I know that seems ludicrous when you think of it, because the, my dragons also breathe fire, and there's nothing on earth that breathes fire. But still, that was so much part of myth, I couldn't part with that. And I approach vampires the same way when I wrote my vampire novel, Fever Dream. You mm -hmm. know, I, I, I looked at the things about vampires that I could justify in a fairly rationalist way, and I kept that. Mm -hmm. But other things about vampires can't cross running water, well, obviously that didn't work for a book set entirely mm -hmm. on the Mississippi. I threw that out. And uh, vampires are not reflected in mirrors. How the hell would that work uh, right. when, when, you know, that violates all the laws of light and physics and right. things like that, so I had to throw that out too. But I played with that and I made, made use to it. So I think what, I, what I'm hearing here, just check me on this, is that you look to history, to science, for a certain level of rigor, so that even when you're constructing um, something that might have fantastical elements, um, you wanted to be sure that it was, that that, that that additional rigor made the story stronger, but that you were also willing to throw out things if they didn't serve the story that you wanted to tell. Yes, So. yes. As a, as a kind of and and you have to think about how every element affects every other element. Mm -hmm. Now, Game of Thrones um, and its sequels, like Tolkien, is a relatively low fa fantasy fantasy. Um, and again, I looked at Tolkien for this. Uh, you know, Gandalf is a wizard, but if you look through the books, he he does very little wizard-like things. That's right. When when orcs attack them, he draws his sword, he stands right next to Boromir and, and Aragorn fighting with a sword. He doesn't just wave his fingers and flames go out and, and destroy everything. Um, even when he's meeting the Balrog on bridge, he's reciting spells and all that, but he's got his staff, he's got his sword, mm -hmm. that he's fighting the Balrog yet. Um, 
And well, I feel like that's and, something you have us be careful of in wild cards too, right? Is that you don't want the magic to be so powerful, so overwhelming, or the the supernatural, the the superhero powers that it it makes the story no longer interesting, right? Yes, yes, yeah. and and you have to look at how everything connects with everything else. I mean, I read, I, I get sent these days like every fantasy that's being published because. That they arrive in hopes of me blurbing them, and mm -hmm. you know I can't possibly even read all of them. Right. But some of them I do look into for a chapter or two, and the ones that have very high fantasy, where the wizards are really all powerful, it really irritates me when the wizards, when they still have kings and princes, and they have mm -hmm. giant armies of ten thousand people are crossing lands to fight, and the wizard makes the giant army disappear by waving his hands. No one would have an army in such a right. world. And there would not be kings in such a world. The wizards would be the kings. That's right. Uh, you know, everything I've known about human nature, you know, we have this innate quest for power and dominance. And if we had the power with just a few spells to undo armies, right. we would be the rulers. Whoever had that power would, would rule. They wouldn't be the advisor to the ruler or someone who lives all alone in a tower. So you have to look, you know, if, if you're going to... If you're going to make pigs fly, you know, it's, it's going to change the pork industry. That's right. uh, <laughs> usually, uh, capturing pigs is going to be much harder. Uh, so think through everything where you depart from real life. And where you don't depart from real life, make sure you learn everything you can about what you're writing about, whether it's, uh, you know, medieval armies or armor and weaponry or... or care and feeding of horses or whatever it is, try to get it right. Because if you get it wrong, somebody will notice and write you letters about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, so that relates to another question I had. Um, I think you said that Game of Thrones was based in part on the War of the Roses. Sure. And if you could talk a little about how you used history, as a, was it a jumping off point? Did you do extensive research? Are there files full of historical notes, timelines, character sheets? Are there spreadsheets? Or is it more that you read it and absorbed it and then went from there? I Well, I do have uh, notes and timelines and spreadsheets and uh, all of that stuff, um, but of my own material, not mm. of the Wars of the Roses. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm going to suck down some no. breakfast here while of course. we talk. Um, but for the actual historical material, it was a matter of war, reading it and absorbing it. Right. Like, uh, you know, for years before I started to write Fever Dream, I collected every book I could on life on the Mississippi in the, in the steamboat era, which, mm -hmm. roughly speaking, was the 1850s through the 1870s. Um, you know, and you never know when you're going to need something, and then you keep the, keep the material on hand. Now, the Internet has changed things, I have to admit. Um, in the old days, you, you really had to absorb the material. It was in books, and uh, it was good if the book was on your shelf, so you didn't have to go running to the library to look up something. Mm -hmm. But you'll find yourself, you know, writing uh, and wondering what kind of underwear they wore in 1850, <laughs> and, and uh, you better know that because... Right. Uh, Someone will call you on it. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Now, of course, uh, you, you can just probably type on Google what kind of underwear were they were in 1850, and you'll get an answer, which may or may not be right. But uh, Although I kind of file, find that, you know, when you read the text, you, you get, like, little incidents, little moments. I'm, I'm working on a, an epic series, a space opera epic series, um, having to do with um, indenture and social movements and fighting for freedom and the right to vote. And I was reading um, John Lewis's graphic novel, March, and just, like, bits of dialogue, moments in conversation between people will then spark ideas, right? And it's not that you're going to necessarily copy it directly from what happened in history, but you, when you go to write your scene, those, those, those moments stay with you, right? Like there's a, you know, the, the little girls who were um, killed in the bombing of the church, for example, right? That that memory, that moment stays and then works its way into your story. Um, that may be... That may now, are you using that real-life moment, or are you doing a fictional version of it? Well, it's... I mean, the, what I'm working on is science fiction, so it is set in space on another planet. Um, so it's more thinking about what sorts of incidents... Like, there's certain incidents that actually kind of come up over and over, 
in Gandhi's story, John Lewis's story, these various things where someone is stands up and it says, well, I'm not willing to be party to this anymore, and if that means you throw me in jail, so be it, right? So it's it's looking at how that plays out. And I think, you know, you Game of Thrones, I was reading an article that was talking about it as sociological fiction in the sense that you, and it reminds me of uh, Gabriel Marquez's Hundred Years of Solitude, right? Because you're writing about big sweeping societal movements. And as a result, even though we meet Ned Stark in the first book and in a sort of more typical fantasy novel, we might get, you know, oh, he's a central character. I care about him. I'm engaged. I'm going to follow him. And then, spoiler, he dies. Um, and in, in, a, in a more standard fantasy novel, I think that wouldn't work here because the story you're telling is a bigger, broader story. And maybe that's what I'm thinking of when I think of epic. Um, it's not really about Ned. It's about the larger changes that are coming to Westeros and these larger struggles for power. So, and I, I feel like the same thing happens in Hundred Years of Solitude, right? It covers a hundred years. All the characters you meet and care for in the beginning of the book are dead by halfway right. through the book. So maybe, um, sorry, so, so I guess the, the question embedded in that is, is, does that seem like a fair characterization of what you were doing, of epics in general, perhaps? Well, any time you cover 100 years, unless you're, you know, <laughs> in a far future thing right. where people now live for a thousand years, yeah, all your characters are, are going to die if you're covering that mm -hmm. period. Uh, so far, you know, Game of Thrones may have taken 100 years to write, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it only actually covers about three or four years so far. Um, I, I was inspired by War, Wars of Roses. I love historical fiction. I read a lot of it. Um, I'm very impressed by the people who do it well, like... Uh, Bernard Cornwell in the current days, or Thomas B. Costain back in the 50s, terrific writers. Nigel Tranter, the great Scottish historical novelist who uh, kept turning out his books until he was in his mid-90s. Uh, nice. Something I hope to emulate. <laughs> Me too. So we're going to be there together. Um, so. But the thing about historical fiction, why I don't write it, is because you're 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 locked in by the history, right? And um, sometimes the history uh, has great stories in it, but sometimes it has frustrating uh, omissions or things that are not known or things that turn out uh, to be the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So by using this as inspiration, but mixing and matching, taking a bit of this, a bit of that, turning it up to 11. I mean, fantasy always has to be a little bigger and brighter and more colorful than real life. Right. So I can be inspired by Hadrian's Wall, mm -hmm. but Hadrian's Wall is like 10 feet tall, and my wall is like 700 feet tall, and right. and made of ice, and uh, <laughs> has, has certain magical uh, spells about it. Um, so yeah, we you, talk you have to go with that. So. The people who read my books and notice the similarities to Wars of the Roses, um, many of them take it too far and they think, oh, I got this now, it's parallel, and they try to do a one-on-one, -on -one, okay, this character is this mm. character, this character, and then they, they come a cropper because the, things don't turn out the way the Wars right. of the Roses turn out, yeah. which is good. I like surprising my readers, whether it's for good or bad, you know, and, and I hate... You know, we, I always think, and that this is something I think every writer should do, you, you write what you want to read. Mm -hmm. um, and what I love to read are, are, are books that draw me in, that, that suck me into a world, but that also surprise me. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many books out there, and believe me, I have sent many of them, where you read the first chapter and you know exactly how it's going to go. You know, you see who the hero is and who the villain is, and, right. you know, here's this... Here's this hero, and he meets this girl, and they can't stand each other. Okay, they'll be in love by the end of the book. Uh, you know, it's it's just the same old stuff, sometimes in, in new bottles. And some of it is tastier than others, yeah. But I prefer books where something happens that I never saw coming, but I look back and say, yes, he, he laid the groundwork for that. She laid the groundwork for that. Um, well enough, but it still took me by surprise. So that's what I try to do for, for my readers. So... Can I ask, in laying the groundwork and, and making these plans, and I feel like um, when you're writing a story and publishing it seriously, when you're, I mean, I think anyone working on an epic, it has to take quite a long time to just, just to do the writing of it, right? Um, even if not complicated by TV series, et cetera, so on, right? So 
As you're writing, surprises must have emerged that ended up contradicting your earlier plans, your expectations when you first started sketching things out. Um, so I'm wondering if there are any examples that come to mind that took effort to manage, if there was a new character that emerged or a discovered continent, a hidden sub subculture, like you're in the midst of book three and suddenly you're like, oh, I did not anticipate that becoming a thing or a prominent thing. Any specifics? Yeah, that does happen with me um, quite a bit. And also the, the, the flip side of that, which is where you... You know, you're writing the first book and you lay in some little hints as to some development that you think you're going to have in the fifth book. But then the plot goes away from that and then you realize as you're writing the fifth book, oh my God, I, I planted those clues, I have to pay that off. Right. Otherwise it's going to be loose end and uh, you have to be aware of that at all time. There, there's... I've often said in lectures there are two kinds of writers who I call the architects and the gardeners. And, and, you know, an architect designs a house and he, he lays out the blueprints and how many rooms it's going to be, what kind of roof is it going to have, um, how is it going to be heated, is it forced air heating, is it baseboard heating, is it uh, electrical heating under the floorboards, uh, you know, where are the toilets going to be, um, is it, does it have a basement, does it not have a basement, every, every detail of the house is worked out before a single nail is drawn, sometimes before the land, the ground is even broken for it, it's all laid out. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are the gardeners, and they dig a hole, and they plant a seed, and <laughs> they see what comes up, <laughs> and they water it, and they hope it grows, it doesn't die. Um, it, the gardeners know little things, I mean, they know whether they planted an oak tree <coughs> or a tulip, <coughs> but... Um, a lot depends on you know the process of growth, and now no writer is a hundred percent gardener or a hundred percent architect, but they do tend to one side or another. And I'm very much uh, a gardener, yeah. um, as Tolkien was. I mean, you know, Lord of the Rings started out being a sequel to The Hobbit, another little adventure for children of hobbits, and it grew, it just grew. into this gigantic three volume uh, thing that borrowed a little from The Hobbit and a lot from The Cimmerillion, which uh, mm -hmm. he. Had, not completed by then, and became this magnificent contribution to world literature. Um, but when you're a gardener, things like that do happen. I was, when I was in my uh, 20s and living in Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, where you live now. Mm -hmm. Great city. <laughs> I, I helped uh, found the Windy City Writers Workshop of uh, science fiction and fantasy writers. We got together once a month and traded stories. And most of us in that were, were young writers in our in our 20s um, or early 30s, but we had the great good fortune to have two members who were older and veterans of science fiction fantasy. One of them was Algis Boudry's, AJ, uh, incredible writer, and the other one was Gene Wolfe. Uh, and Gene was, we just lost Gene this last year. I hadn't seen him for years, but he was an amazing man. And he was so good at those writers' workshops, at taking stories apart and telling you things to do and not to do. But we were fortunate because we were in this workshop and getting to see what eventually became Gene's um, the Shadow, Shadow of the, the Claw, Torture right, books, the, the, you know, which started as a trilogy and ultimately so it became four books. The thing is, Gene... Gene had a day job. He was he was the editor of Plant Engineering Magazine, and he wrote weekends and nights. Mm. Um, and he wrote that entire trilogy, well, it was a trilogy, it became four books. He wrote the entire thing before he let any of it be published. Mm. So, you know, when he wrote f book four and finished it, now he could go back and revise book one because right. it hadn't been published yet. And he could get everything all polished and all that before he sent it to the editor. And I've often envied Gene's ability to do that. I mean, in a perfect world, I would have written all of the books of, of Game okay. of Ice and Fire before I let the first one go out. Um, but I don't have a day job. I'm not the editor of Plant Engineering <laughs> Magazine, and I depend on the earnings from my uh, from right. my book. So when I finished Game of Thrones, I had to sell it and send it to my publisher and have it published. But inevitably, when you do that, 
then you have the choice, well, do I go back now and revise book one because right. of the things I later know with book five? I've always thought that was sort of cheating, so I don't expect I'm going to do that, but there's yeah, part I of me that wishes I could. I always think of Dickens, right, who had to serialize even a novel, right, and right, send it right. out chapter by chapter and just how frustrating it must have been when he wanted to change things and couldn't, right? So and there, um, there are Dickens like... Uh, people doing that on the internet even now they're, they're no, it's, it's been re-emerging as a new internet. form right sending it out section by section i'm, I'm seeing bujold I, i'm reading her new series that she's been releasing as little ebooks um the the penrick series which i think is going to end up basically being one long novel when it's all together um but but because she's releasing them in pieces uh it's yeah, she won't be able to go back and change it unless I agree. I, I'm I'm with you in that I would I would have a hard time going back and revising something that was already published and, and out there. All right, I have just a, a few more questions um, that I asked people what they wanted to ask you, and I they had so many questions for you, but we're keeping it to this topic. So um, one thing people were asking about was world building, and um, just when you're when you're trying to do something that has such a large scope. You know, do you start small and specific with here's a moment, here's a place, here's a character, um, and then let it get big? Or do you have sort of a, a sense of the larger world at the beginning of it and then kind of focus in from there? You know, as a gardener, I, I had no idea when I started. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even, when, when, you know, the first chapter came to me, I, mm -hmm. I thought maybe this is a short story or something, but even by the time I finished, it only took me like two, three days to write that first chapter. That's so interesting. I was just uh, reading and, and, um, Le Guin's, um, you know, they reissued the Earthsea books for the 50th anniversary, and they um, included an introduction by her where she, she talks about starting with maps, um, that she actually drew the maps of Earthsea and then from there, kind of focused in on that moment on the Isle of Gaunt. And then, then I think was very gardener like in her approach after that, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, uh, I just started writing. I wrote the first chapter, and by the time I finished that, I knew what the second chapter had to be. And, you know, I, I'm introducing characters along the way. I, I think I was probably about 50, 60 pages in before I decided I better draw a map. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I, I drew it on a, just on a piece of typing paper, you know, 9 right. by 12. And, um, I actually had to use two because uh, the north was, I had a line that the north was as big as this, all the six kingdoms in the south combined. So, right. uh, so I had to do it on two. So the shape was dictated by the shape of the typing paper of uh, my continent of Westeros. <laughs> and at some point also, I'd been throwing in these occasional references to... Uh, to history, to give the sense of history, you know. Um, There's a depth to it all. To dead right. kings and all that. And I said, well, I better, I better make a list of all these dead kings and mm -hmm. work out that. So I just, you know, made up names and dates and uh, tried to vary it. Some reigning a long time, some reigning a short time, etc. Um, and their relation to the king before mm. them. Even then I got myself in trouble when... when uh, uh, some of the material had been published. Uh, Elio and Linda, my, my fans who do the Westeros website, pointed out that my chronology couldn't actually work, so I had to alter that. <laughs> well, you know, in, in the eons of transcription of this, some things were inevitably lost and mistranscribed. And But I love the depth of it. I think that is um, part of what sets Westeros apart, uh, similar to Jean's books, actually, is that they have such a sense of depth and complexity. And I think when you... When I'm, I love epic fantasy, but I would agree that a lot of what I, I pick up is a, a little thin by comparison, right? And maybe it's because the authors have not done the, the layering that you do in that. Does that make sense as a... Uh, we, we owe all of it to Tolkien, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, he changed the face of, uh, mm -hmm. of epic fantasy. Um, I remember, you know being a, a kid in, in junior high and high school reading The Lord of the Rings when it was coming out. And uh, I, I enjoyed those books so much. I loved those books so much. I didn't want them to end. And as I'm, I'm reading, you know, I'm halfway through Return of the King, and it seems in the, and the ring has already gone into Mount Doom. I'm saying, oh, my God, it's almost over. Well, wait a minute, there's still a lot of pages left here. And, uh, and of course, I had the scouring of the Shire. I am which so I, I, mad that that was left out of the movies. It's the most important part. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's a very important part, yes. 
and, and although I don't think I understood that as a, mm. as a junior high school kid. I no, know, no. What the hell is, what the hell is all this? And right. <laughs> they put the ring in here. And then I hit the appendices. Right. And at first I was enraged because I thought I had more story. And mm. instead I have all these footnotes and appendices. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> but as I've gotten older and I've looked back, I really appreciate the appendices. See, mm-hmm. Tolkien really worked out all the, all the world, the, the kings of Numenor and the, you know, the history of the, uh, of the various kingdoms of Middle Earth and their rise and fall. He had, he had all of that. Yeah. Yeah, all of that worked out, and uh, of course later I heard about his his life. Um, it turns out he'd been working on the Cimmerillion all this mm-hmm. time since since World War One, mm-hmm. and it was a book he never completed during his lifetime. Right. Um, but he had all of this background. In some ways, that was more interesting than to him than the than the foreground story. Right. Um, so I set out to you know kind of emulate that and and. I've gone about it in a different order, but you know, I've recently published Fire and Blood, which mm-hmm. is my book of imaginary history, and I have more to do. I have a Fire and Blood two to do, and that just covers Westeros. That I have a whole other world there, so it's developed in some mm. detail. But <clears throat> you know, they they say of icebergs that uh, <clears throat> three quarters of it is below the surface, right. so you're just seeing the iceberg. You're just seeing a little bit on top, and Tolkien's work truly was an iceberg, where, Mm -hmm. you know, you saw The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings were were on top, and then there was this immense construct underneath it. Most fantasy writers have some ice piled up on a raft. (laughs) That's (laughs) a great image, There's nothing under the water, they're just faking it, and that was true of me, too, when I began, but I think at this point, now I have... I have a fair amount of ice. I speak it. Well, that's a that's a great. Um, I think that is, in fact, where where I have I have trouble. I think, and I think it's laziness. Honestly, I think it's this sense of like, oh, that's a lot of work that nobody's ever going <laughs> to see. But of course, it is. Even if people don't see it directly, it makes what they do see so much better, right? And so it it is worthwhile. It if, is. If you look at the fantasies before Tolkien, mm-hmm. it was very different. I mean, Lord Dunsany, who was a, a brilliant mm-hmm. writer. It's all, you it's know... It's very stylized, and right? And once upon a time, yeah. there was a king, mm-hmm. and, you know, he had a beautiful daughter, and uh, then an elf came in. But it, you don't get the sense of, okay, what was the name of the dynasty this king was? Who was the king before him? How did this dynasty come to power? How many kings have there been? How many, uh, you know... Uh, I think Dunson is, I mean, he's closer to to folklore and fairy tale, right? right. And in the mode of storytelling, whereas what you're doing is closer, and Tolkien is closer to historical fiction, um, okay, well, we are, we're almost out of time. I, I'll just leave with, is there anything you'd like to mention that we haven't talked about, advice to young writers getting started with epic fantasy, or like me, middle-aged writers mired in the muddle of an epic space opera? Um, so it doesn't have to be fantasy, just when you're, when you're working through the epic, is there anything else you'd like to, to add? Well, um, when, when I'm talking to aspiring writers, I always tell them to persist um, this is not a job that will give you any security ever. If you psychologically, you need security. I hear accountancy is good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, something, you know, you take a job and, and you get a promotion every few years and a raise and eventually they give you a gold watch. That won't happen mm-hmm. with, with writing. Um, <clears throat> I've had in many ways a, a career that, uh, most people would envy. And yet there've been at least two times in my career where it all crashed and burned and I thought I was going to have to, you know, get a job selling real estate or or something like that. Um, I, I, you know, you can be the hottest guy in the world one moment and then two years later your agents won't return your phone calls. Um, So you have to be prepared for that. Um, You have to, um, and you have to persist. You know, if, if you write a book and no one wants to buy it, write another book. Maybe someone will still buy that unsold book one of these days, but meanwhile, write another one and then write another one and write another one. Don't don't stop writing. I mean, I look at the people who started with me in the early 70s, and uh, some of them sadly have passed on. Others have just disappeared. I presume they're out there somewhere, but they're, mm-hmm. they're not writing anymore. Right. I don't see their work. They, they, hit, a, they hit an iceberg or... Mm-hmm. They hit a period of rejection, they gave it up. You are going to get a lot of rejection. And uh, you have to 
we have to push through that. And uh, That's one of the things I always tell my students. I mean, even as an editor, when we were editing Strange Horizons, there were a lot of writers who would be rejected once or twice and then stop submitting to us. And you always want to say to them, look, there are people who we've rejected eight times and then we bought the ninth story, right? And then because they got to there, they, you know, they just had to work right. through to that point. So, um and you know we're we're here in Dublin having this uh, discussion mm -hmm. on and the World Science Fiction Convention is about to begin. That's another thing I also tell young writers. Uh, you know, in, in an ideal world, I suppose it would just be the words on the paper that matter. But in the real world, it helps to have connections. It helps to network mm -hmm. um, and to come to these things. You know, there are uh, there are things you can learn from the panels and the discussions. But even more than that. Just meeting other writers, meeting the editors, meeting the agents, sitting down with them, having a cup of coffee, uh, hearing what they're talking about, and and you know, talking about what you're talking about, and you hear what they're doing, and what they hear what you're doing, and you know, maybe a few years from now, one of them will be editing an anthology, and they'll say, oh, you know, I should ask that that, that person I met at that Dublin Con mm -hmm. was uh, was um, maybe I'll invite him or her to. Uh, submit to my anthology and mm -hmm. it's it's not a it's very human it's, it's, yeah it's 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 the way things work in Hollywood and and in this world and yeah there are a few people there's always the JD Salingers or the Greg Egan's in our world mm -hmm. people that nobody knows who just sit at home and write their books but a lot of it, uh, it it helps to be part of this convention circuit and to be plugged into the to the world also for me anyway it's fun yeah. <laughs> I love going to conventions. I love seeing my friends um, and uh, seeing what's going on with them. Yeah, I'm looking forward to Worldcon. It's going to be a blast. So, well, I think that's the end of our time. So uh, thank you so much, George. As always, a pleasure to talk with you. This was Marianne Moenraj interviewing George R. R. Martin for the Speculative Literature Foundation. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.